Sure. Thanks. Thanks so much, Fraz. And hi, everybody. Um, my name's Freya McGregor. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And by the way, next week's webinar, I happen to know Krista Rolls. Um, she's the presenter for the next next yeah next week's London Birds webinar. And if you if you if you're anything other than an expert birder, I suspect you might learn something from her um, really awesome way of explaining about bird ID. Um, she's got a really good, really clear way of. Um, of teaching. So I'm excited to go and, and learn from her again um, next week here. Um, anyway, today we are here to talk about birdability. Um, and birdability, uh, well, I'll tell you more in a second, but I'm the birdability coordinator. I'm also an occupational therapist. And um, if you don't know what an OT is, occupational therapy is a healthcare profession and it's all about enabling people to do the things in their everyday life that they have difficulty doing because of an injury, illness or disability. And so sometimes that's things like tying shoelaces and cooking dinner, um, having a shower, and sometimes it's things like birding. So there you go, bonus knowledge today. Um, <laughs> So Birdability is a brand new nonprofit. We're based in the US. Uh, if you're wondering, I'm originally from Australia, um, but I married an American. So I'm currently in Alabama um, in the US. Uh, but we believe we have a global, um, global reach because uh, any time that there are humans and there are birds, uh, the stuff that we uh, feel passionately about is relevant. So um, our vision is that birding truly is for everybody and every body, regardless of disability or other health concerns. And our mission is to share the joys of birding with people who have disabilities and to ensure birding is accessible to everybody. So what do you see in this photo? By the way, if you have um, any kind of visual disability, I will be um, describing everything that is presented on the screen so you won't miss out on any information. So I this is a visual prompt, but I'm going to describe it. Um, so don't worry if you um, if you need to turn off your screen or turn away, you won't um, you won't miss any visual cues. So I see a bunch of folks uh, using wheelchairs. I see a couple of different wheelchairs that look a bit more kind of off road, sort of um, knobbly tires and and a third wheel for more stability. Uh, I see someone who's standing. Uh, it's worth noting that not all disabilities are visible. And I see it. everyone has binoculars and is looking at a couple of different birds and it looks like they might be on an accessible trail. It's paved and, and wide and flat. And uh, this photo was actually taken at a Tucson Audubon accessible bird outing in Arizona uh, that they held in partnership with Southern Arizona Adaptive Sports. I just, it's a really fun photo. So what do we know? We know that time spent in nature is good for us. I probably don't have to convince you of this fact, but there's more and more scientific evidence supporting this concept. Um, we know that it helps decrease feelings of anxiety. It helps increase feelings of peace and control um, of your own life. Um, we know that it, time spent in nature can help improve your attentional capacity, which is how much like brain space you have to you know, focus on something. Uh, and most people just sort of know that inherently that, that spending time in nature is a good thing. We also know that birds can be the gateway to spending time in nature. They're colourful. They make all kinds of weird noises. They can fly. Wow. So birds, birds can be that kind of excuse um, to spend time in nature and reap all those health and wellness benefits. Now, Again, I apologize if this is very US centric and you're from other places. Um, and I would love to hear, by the way, I would love to hear um, perspectives and experiences and insights from, from anyone um, in the US or outside of the US. As I said, I'm not from the US. So, so the global perspective is really, uh, really awesome to me. It's really cool to be um, here with Faraz in Trinidad and Derek in South Africa. And I saw Susie's in the UK. So it, I'm, 
I'm genuinely very excited to be talking with you all today on this. But in the US, we know <laughs> that birding is the fastest growing leisure activity. Uh, and it, 20 years ago, the statistics um, showed that there were 85 million Americans who were engaged in some way in birding. And that number has only grown significantly during um, COVID and lockdown. We, we know that by eBird um, submissions and um, membership increases to things like the National Audubon Society, which is a big birding and conservation nonprofit in the US. Um, and we know that birding has the potential to be inclusive and accessible. Potential. There's some work to be done. We also know that one in four Americans has a disability. And this statistic, I would imagine, would not be any less anywhere else on the planet, I would imagine. Um, so again, I apologize for the US centric statistics, but um, of those folks, we know there's 20 million Americans who have some kind of mobility challenge uh, and 7 million who are blind or have low vision. So that's a lot of folks. Um, I've heard that the statistic in Australia is more like one in three um, Australians has a disability and depends how you define disability, you know, with this statistic. But we also know we're talking about our future selves. Um, as we go, grow, grow older, uh, things happen in life uh, that may have an impact on our ability to access nature and birding the way we always have. And I know that I would like to be birding and outside when I'm 95 years old. Um, I also had an experience two years ago when I woke up one day and I couldn't straighten my knee uh, and I was unable to straighten it for the following six months until the physical therapy or, or physiotherapy, um, depending where you're from, um, got me got my knee straight again. I'm still having trouble with my knee. I call it a dodgy knee because I don't have a diagnosis. Uh, it's evaded all efforts at this point. And it makes it difficult for me to go birding and hiking as I used to. Um, so although I don't identify as having a disability myself, I definitely have an accessibility challenge. And you, as a pessimistic as it is, you never know when this might happen to you or someone you like going birding with. Um, so, Working on access and inclusion in birding may be a perfectly excellent selfish thing to do. Um, so through education, outreach and advocacy, Birdability works to ensure the birding community and the outdoors are welcoming, inclusive, safe and accessible for everybody. We focus on people with mobility challenges, blindness or low vision, chronic illness, intellectual or developmental disabilities, mental illness, and those who are neurodivergent, deaf or hard of hearing, or who have other health concerns. But inherently, we're including a bunch more folks who might be benefiting from our work. Our parents with strollers absolutely have a mobility challenge. Our grandparents with toddlers who maybe can't walk as far as, as the adults can. Older people who are just slowing down. People with new medical diagnoses, maybe cancer or a new chronic illness diagnosis. Folks with dodgy knees. I'm not the only one. And again, this is our future selves. In addition to current birders, we strive to introduce birding to people with disabilities and other health concerns who are not yet birders. So they too can experience the joys of birding. And we have a huge list of ways to Find these people who may not realise that they could get so much out of spending time enjoying birds. Uh, a lot of work ahead of us. We want to tap into local disability support groups for folks with spinal cord injuries and, and people who have amputations or limb differences, multiple sclerosis, stroke survivors, veterans. My husband is a combat veteran, uh, so this one is particularly near and dear to my heart. Um, Bird festivals, we want to see accessible outings as part of every bird festival. Kids disabled camps, centres for independent living, schools for the deaf and blind, rehab hospitals, Easter Seals, that's a um, disability nonprofit here in the US, um, assisted living centres, nursing homes, um, and scouting and 4-H groups. 4-H um, in the US, um, it's sort of a... Um, uh, I'm probably the worst person to explain it because I didn't grow up um, being involved in 4-H, but it's about kind of farming, rural farming skills 
Um, and it's sort of run through like high school uh, as a sort of extracurricular thing. That's what 4 H is. So sorry for the <laughs> deep cultural references. Scouting, like like Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or Girl Guides. Um, again, sorry, depending on, on where you're from on the planet. Anyway, the point is, there are a lot of folks who may not realise they could be birders uh, and we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to discover this uh, in themselves because birding is for everybody and everybody. So the best we can be is waiting for us in nature. Virginia Rose said that, and I'm about to introduce you to her virtually. Um, and if this is true, shouldn't everybody have the opportunity to find their best selves? So Virginia is the founder and president of Birdability, who I have not yet met in person, believe it or not, although we work together really closely every day. Uh, she lives in Texas. Um, I'm in Alabama. It's about a 12 hour drive. Uh, but I'm going to meet her in August, so we're going to rectify this really soon. Um, she's a retired high school English teacher who lives in Austin, Texas, and she's been a birder for 17 years. Um, she had a horse riding uh, accident when she was 14, which resulted in a T10 spinal cord injury, which means that she cannot feel or move her legs. And so she uses a manual wheelchair to get around. And without Virginia here uh, in person or virtually, uh, this is the next best way for you to meet her. I was driving home one day from school and I heard there was going to be a lecture sponsored by Travis Audubon on the breeding success of the house finch. And I thought, that sounds interesting. And I went and I loved it. I had so much fun in the lecture and I came out and I called my mom right away. I said, Mom, why didn't you tell me I was a nerd? My life would have been so much easier. Then I started signing up for all the Travis Audubon classes. The field trip leaders never skipped a beat. They just picked me up and took me with them. Literally picked me up. And I've been with them now for about 15 years. Now I'm on the board of directors. Oh, I led beginning bird walks for them for seven years. That's the great crested flycatcher. Ta -ta. So then I started thinking about how can I take that wonderful experience and give it to other people, other people in wheelchairs, other people who don't know that they can do it. And so I started thinking I need to form an organization called Birdability and then my job is to find as many physically challenged people and help introduce them to birding, get them situated in Austin all with the accessible places that I have already found and get that pilot program kind of functioning that way and then take it to the national parks so that they know that the, this is a viable population that needs to be rep well represented and birding offers you a way to belong to a group who's outside learning, practicing conservation and contributing. I mean, it's a community just waiting for you. I'm excited about the prospects of not only getting physically challenged people in parks, but getting physically challenged kids in parks. Because I just feel like that can be such an important springboard for them into their lives. The reason why I love using a manual chair is because it's my way of walking. It's, this is walking for me. You know, I've been in a chair 45 years. You have to go for something challenging, something you may not be able to do, and then figure it out. And the amazing thing is that nine times out of 10, you will figure it out. And the feeling that comes from having figured it out is so empowering and so great. Well, I can just tuck that away as a great accomplishment. And I say, of course it's hard, but that's where your feeling of accomplishment comes from. So that's Virginia. 
And that video, by the way, was made three years ago before Birdability was a nonprofit. And it's really cool to hear um, how much of that is, is happening right now um, and how much of that has changed, which is not very much, just a few words here and there. So when Virginia started birding, she discovered there were a bunch of difficulties. Um, physical, the physical environment caused a bunch of, um, created a bunch of barriers for her. Parking was an issue often. Gates are not always designed for people in wheelchairs to uh, pass, even if standing people can. Bathrooms, there's a whole lot in bathrooms. Sink height, um, stall or cubicle size, grab rails, the, the door into the bathroom, if it holds itself open or it's too heavy to push. There's a whole lot in bathrooms. Um, steps and curbs. Now, Virginia's in a manual wheelchair. There's also power wheelchairs, by the way, the ones that operate on a battery. Um, but just one step, just one step, people say, oh, it's accessible. It's just one step. Oh, that, that's the difference for Virginia be between being able to access that location independently and unattended versus needing someone to give her a hand. And for Virginia, and for a lot of folks, being unattended, being able to just do it by yourself without having to rely on someone else, that's where all this empowerment um, and accomplishment comes from. So just one step, that's a problem. Railing height and that top railing width or, or depth, um, this is a really big one if you're seated because often, very often, those railings have not been designed with, with this population in mind. Mud and sand, not so easy in a wheelchair. And she's in Texas. So there's a lot of cattle guards and cactus spines and cow patties uh, chasing, chasing birds out uh, on, in paddocks or fields. Uh, cow patties are a thing. And it's one thing to have them on the wheels, on her wheels, but it's another thing as a wheelchair user, whatever is on your wheels ends up on your hands. And then on your optics. So um, all of these things created a lack of independence for her. But as you heard her say at the end of that video, something close to this, difficulty and uncertainty lead to empowerment and joy. <laughs> I really love this photo. This is Virginia and her sister. They're, they're in East Texas. They've just been looking for a Swainson's warbler, which migrate through East Texas in the spring. Uh, but they're really kind of skulky. They, they're really sneaky and quiet and really hard to see at the best of times. And they've just been out trying to find a Swainson's Wobbler and they found one. Um, and I just love the empowerment and joy in this photo. But while we have this photo up, uh, this is Virginia's van. Uh, she drives by herself. Uh, there are lots and lots of awesome modifications you can have done to a vehicle so that you can drive. Uh, and so she drives, but to get into her van, there's that ramp on the side. And I, I know this is definitely the case in the US and in Australia. I don't, I don't intend to talk about other countries that I'm not familiar with, but uh, here in the US, uh, there's accessible parking spaces that'll have that wheelchair symbol kind of reserving the parking space for someone with um, a, a disabled parking permit or, or license plates or number plates. Uh, and there's also van accessible parking spaces and they're different. And the difference is the van accessible spaces have that extra aisle, that side space that's got those diagonal lines there. And that is not a parking space. That is in, for this reason here, for that ramp to come out of the vehicle. Because if Virginia can't deploy her ramp and have the space needed to get on and off her ramp, it doesn't matter how accessible that location is if you can't get out of her vehicle. So please, please never park, never park um, in an accessible parking space if you don't need it. And especially never park um, in that aisle, that special space, um, because it's, that's the difference for some people about whether they can get there or not. So why did, why did Virginia keep Keep birding if there was all these difficulties because there were so many more joys. She had learning to do. That's what we're here today, right? Learn the birds. Friendships to be made. Uh, travel opportunities. This photo was taken up in Ohio, which is on, the, she's in Texas in the central 
southern part of the US. Ohio is up on the northern part of the US, just near Canada, um, at a big, uh, the biggest week in American Birding Bird Festival. But you don't have to travel far places to enjoy the travel that birding can provide. Even just exploring a new park or a new birding location half an hour down the road counts as travel that, that you might not have done if it wasn't for birds. The physical health benefits of being outside and moving your body, confidence, navigating um, unexpected terrain and barriers, independence, community. Oh my goodness, the birding community. There's so much joy to be had right here. A purpose, something to do, something to look forward to doing on the weekends or weeknights or week mornings. Uh, and of course, the birds themselves. And all of these created empowerment and joy. And Virginia realized that she wanted to share the, she didn't, she realized that a lot of folks with, with accessibility challenges may not realize they too could have all of this. And so she wanted to, to share all of these joys of birding uh, with, with anybody with a disability or other health concern. And that is why birdability exists. Because no one can predict what an individual with an accessibility challenge can or cannot do. Not even the individual themselves often until they've tried. Virginia is very strong about a message of going and trying and seeing what happens instead of assuming that you can't. And as an occupational therapist, I've certainly seen this played out in clinical settings all the time. Um, just try. You never know. You never know what you might be able to do. So there's a lot of different um, considerations that help um, determine if a birding location really is accessible or not, or partly accessible, or accessible to some people but not to others. Uh, when, and by the way, when I say birding location, I'm not just talking about trails, I'm talking about bird blinds and observation um, platforms and feeder stations and anywhere that you might, car birding sites, anywhere that you might bird. So um, not everybody with an access challenge needs all of these features to be present. That's also really important to know. For example, there are some things that I need um, and there are some things that Virginia needs and some of those things like a Venn diagram, we both need, but some only I need and some, so there's a bunch. But here's some highlights. Parking, we already talked about parking. There's a van accessible parking spot. You know all about that aisle and why that's really important. Finding out the trail information ahead of time. So many websites just say, we have an accessible trail. Uh-huh. <laughs> but they don't give any more information. And there's so much more information that a lot of people really wanna have before they decide if it's worth them driving two hours or something to get to this place. Um, this also includes having this information available on signs um, at the trailhead. And we're about to um, talk about the birdability map, which is our solution to having this information available ahead of time. But before I get there, this sign, by the way, most of these photos were taken at Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky, which is just where we used to live um, before we, the army station that's in Alabama. And this is my favorite, favorite accessible birding trail. It's fabulous and the birding is amazing. Um, at this spot. So this trail sign has really detailed information about the length of the trail and the surface, the tread width, the gradient or the, or the slope, the steepness, and the cross slope, which is how much of an angle you'll be on as you travel down that trail. And you may not think that's relevant, but if you use a mobility device, especially a, a, a power or a manual wheelchair, how much of a slope you're on is really important because you don't want to tip over. That's really bad news. Um, the other amazing thing about this trail is there was this information at the trailhead. There was this information when there was a spur trail coming off. You can sort of see it on this map. There's a spur trail coming off and this same information was available at that intersection. And then the concrete paved trail portion ended here uh, and an, a, a dirt trail continued. And the same information was there at that junction. And it told me what was coming next if I continued onto the dirt path. Now, the first time I went here was about 15 months ago. Um, just at the start of COVID, we, we could get here without interacting with anybody. And I was still learning how to test out my knee. 
And if I didn't have that information at that intersection, I would have just assumed I couldn't continue on. And I would have just come back the way we'd, we'd already come on the paved surface. But because I could get this really detailed information about how steep it was going to be and then what the surface was, we kept going. And I ended up hiking seven miles that day, which was a huge amount at that point in my journey with my dodgy knee. So this information is really powerful. Bathroom accessibility. I mentioned a few factors that go into that, but if you're ever involved with um, renting or establishing porta loos or porta potties or um, whatever they're called, <laughs> portable bathrooms, um, usually you can get hold of a standard sized one or an accessible one. And if you only if you have if you can get two, get one of each. But if you can only get one, get the accessible one because anybody can use the accessible one. And I know I would rather use the accessible one because there's usually a bit more space. It doesn't get quite as hot and sticky inside, and it means anyone can use it. If you only have the standard size one, there's a bunch of people who won't be able to use the bathroom. Interpretive signs. There's quite a bit that goes into interpretive signs too. Uh, making sure the, the trail surface continues up to that sign uh, and having that sign at a height and an angle that someone who is shorter or seated can read is really important. The really good contrast between the colour of the text and the background of the sign. This sign has a tactile component. That top right hand corner is um, is touchable and it looks it looks and feels like the bark of a sycamore tree the sign's talking about the the floodplain and how there's all these sycamore trees there and um, there's a lot of folks who will really appreciate that tactile component uh, it's not just people who are blind or have low vision there's people with print disabilities there might be little kids there's people like me who just like doing things to learn um, people maybe who who uh, English maybe is not their first language or, or any other language uh, wherever the site is located um, can still get something out of it because there's something to feel. And then the, the, a really awesome thing for interpretive science to have is some kind of audio component so that all these folks who cannot access printed text can still access this information and this learning opportunity that the sign is trying to um, provide you with. So some places have like a like a wand thing that you might, you know, you might borrow um, from an art gallery or something and you walk around pressing the buttons and listening to what, what is printed on the sign. That's great. Um, but if the visitor center is closed or here at Mammoth Cave where this trail is, the visitor center is quite a ways away from this trailhead. Uh, some, sometimes there's people um, can use QR codes that you scan with your phone and then you can hear the audio, which is also really cool unless you don't have a phone um, or you've run out of battery or in the case of Mammoth Cave, there is zero reception at, at all. Uh, so at Mammoth Cave, uh, along this trail, all the signs have this pillar next to it, which is solar powered, so it will never run out of batteries. It doesn't close at 5 p.m. Um, and you can just press the button and hear the audio. That is so awesome. That is so cool. Uh, and last time I was there, I listened and I learned how to say those flowers names on the sign in uh, th their scientific name. I don't have any Latin skills, but I, I learned that because of the audio component. So um, there's this really important concept that even though you you may be thinking you're just including folks who are blind or have low vision by something that you do, there's actually all these other people who will likely benefit from the work that you're putting in, which is really awesome. Maintenance is really important. Uh, just because you have a beautifully accessible birding location today does not mean it will still be accessible tomorrow or next year or in five years time. Vegetation, trees growing over the trail or branches that haven't been pruned that are at head height are a problem for folks, especially who are blind or have low vision, who may smack into them. Uh, vegetation that also hasn't been um, maintained and is encroaching over the trail means that that width so that people comfortably can pass each other, especially if they're wider because they use a mobility device. Um, is really important. Snow may or may not be relevant where you are, um, but if it is, um, knowing, having access to the ploughing schedule. 
so that someone can decide after a big snow if it's worth them visiting that location uh, today or maybe it won't be plowed again for the next two days so there's no point in them going that's that's really important information for a bunch of folks and leaves uh, again may or may not be relevant depending on where you are but in um, much of North America uh, autumn tends to create a lot of leaves on the ground and if that hasn't been swept or anything um, the kind of thick matting can make it can make it be a trip hazard for anybody or a slip hazard for anybody if they get wet but it can also make such a such a kind of carpet that it's really really difficult for folks with any kind of mobility challenge to to get through so maintenance is really important not to mention cracks in um pavement roots coming up through pavement boardwalk planks you know undoing and making a trip hazard um there's there's heaps more in that one railings uh we brushed up past this earlier but this viewpoint at this fabulous trail at mammoth cave the first time i walked past it i thought oh my goodness someone's broken their amazing viewpoint this is terrible what kind of vandalism is this and i got closer and I realized that those two segments of the safety barrier were intact. They're just made out of perspex. This is incredible. It means not only do people, um, people who use wheelchairs like Virginia can see through it because that top thick railing has been removed, but little kids sitting in strollers or pushes can see through. Um, toddlers don't have to run up and like peer through the jail bars of that safety barrier. And me with my dodgy knee, I can have a rest, a very appreciated rest on that bench, rest my knee and still see that view. So being a, removing the barrier, if possible, don't remove the safety barrier. You don't want people to fall over the cliff, but removing the, the visual obstruction um, Amazing, amazing. Steps or other obstacles, we spoke about this earlier. Roots, steps, curb cuts being present or not um, off a sidewalk or a footpath. And bird blinds or bird hides, uh, there's a whole lot that go into that as well. Uh, one of them is the window height and whether or not uh, someone who is seated or who is shorter can see out of the window uh, this, this blind has different heights of windows, which is really, really cool. Unfortunately, this blind also has mulch or tan bark on the, on the floor. Not super great for mobility devices. So there's a lot that go into bird blinds. And there's so many different kinds of bird blinds as well. So now you know a whole bunch about the physical accessibility uh, considerations of birding locations. You can help us build the vertibility map. Um, this map is an online resource. Again, I'm sorry, I should have gone through this earlier. It's, it's not only in the US, it's all over the world. We want map, we want locations submitted from all over the planet um, of any reasonably accessible birding location. Like I said, uh, different people have different needs uh, and there are actually a very few locations that are like 100,000% perfectly accessible. So Anything that's reasonably accessible, we would love to have pinned on the birdability map. Uh, the map is hosted um, through with us and National Audubon, um, and we're actually about to do a big update soon. So that's really exciting. To all these, all these gold, uh, sorry, all these yellow diamonds, uh, the single ones indicate that there's a birding location there that's been pinned. If there's a number, you have to zoom in closer until they sort of separate out, and you can click on them. Um, but to add to the map, you click the Submit a Birdability Site Review button and a checklist pops up and it's really straightforward. You don't have to make any judgment calls about whether or not someone with some kind of access challenge could or couldn't do this trail or visit this bird blind. You just have to tell us what you find. So you don't need to be um, experienced at all. You just need to be observant. And I guess as birders, you probably already are. Um, there's always a comments or other box so you can write in information if you're not really sure what the answer was or it was just your best guess. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and then when you submit the site review and you click on the yellow diamond, up will pop um, this detailed information that a lot of folks need, really need to know ahead of time before they can go to that location. Uh, you can also 
link directly to an individual site review so that if you work or volunteer at a nature center or you hold bird outings and you want to tell people about the location that the outing will be held at, you can link directly to one of the site reviews um, so that that's sort of taken care of for you once you've submitted the site review. So please check that out. All right, complete change of direction here, or not complete, just slightly. Um, I am on a bit of a mission to redefine birding as the act of enjoying wild birds. Now, growing up in Australia, we always talked about bird watching. My parents have been bird watchers since they were, I think my mum was a little kid and my dad when he met her in their 20s. Uh, and they always said the birding is a very American term and there's nothing wrong with that. We just, we weren't American. Uh, and so that's, that's how I grew up. But in the last year or so, this idea has been growing on me more and more. And I propose that, yes, bird watching is one kind of enjoying wild birds, but I propose we all, everybody who enjoys wild birds describes themselves as a birder and that they go birding because not everybody watches birds, right? Not everyone can see. Birding, if it's defined as the act of enjoying wild birds, doesn't have any limitations on how you enjoy them. You don't have to move down a trail. You can be stationary. You don't have to go somewhere. You can enjoy them from your kitchen. If you can hear them or see them out your window, you don't have to be, um, you don't have to use optics. You don't have to see them at all. You don't even have to know what they're called to enjoy wild birds. And I say that if you enjoy wild birds, then congratulations, you're a birder. We don't need any hierarchy about birding versus bird watching in either direction. We can all just be birders. And sure, there'll be twitches and listers and there'll be casual birders like Faraz um, and there'll be slow birders and there'll be bird enjoyers. Sure, sure, sure. But if we're all just birders, how much more welcoming and inclusive is that? for the whole birding community, and especially for beginner birders who so often say things like, oh, I don't know if I'm really a birder yet. I've only been out 10 times and I've only seen 20 different species. Like who, who grants the qualification to, to enable you to define yourself as a birder? Forget that. Just let's all just be birders. How, how much more welcoming and inclusive is that? So if we're all going to be birders, we don't have to talk about bird watches. I don't talk about bird watches anymore um, because of this. Um, of course, you're free to identify however you like, but this is, this is what I'm running with. I reckon we're all just birders. And again, you can do whatever you like. And Virginia, who cannot walk, talks about going on bird walks. But at Birdability, I use the word bird outing or field trip because not everybody can walk or can walk very far um, and it's just that little bit more inclusive and maybe more welcoming for folks who may not realize if they could come on that event with you um, so everyone has different preferences for words that are used and um, but I, I am using bird outing now it also inherently includes all different ways of going out to enjoy birds because sometimes your bird outing might just be going to a bird blind and hanging out there for an hour and a half or car birding or something. So take it or leave it, but that's, that's what I'm doing. Uh, but while we're on language use, uh, this, one, this one is definitely different. Um, I'm sure different in different countries and different cultural, um, with people with different cultural backgrounds. Um, this, we, we know this is different too, generationally, even just here in the US. So, um, Again, take this or leave it, but if you're not sure where to start, I wanted to include this just to give you some kind of starting point. There's more information about almost everything that I cover in this presentation in the web address on the bottom. Um, this is just meant to be a starting point. Again, everyone uh, has the right to identify how they, how they wish. And if someone tells you that they would prefer you use a different word, please use their word that they asked for. Don't say, oh, well, Freya at Birdability said, 
no, no, no. This is just supposed to be a starting point. Um, in general, many people these days uh, in the US and in Australia uh, don't use the words handicapped or impaired. They're considered pretty outdated. Uh, and it's not offensive to say that someone has a disability or is disabled because there's nothing inherently wrong with that. So why would it be offensive? Again, different people will have different preferences, but this is, this is, uh, this is where we are at the moment in the US and in Australia. Uh, but normal, definitely normal is not a good word to use in this context, because what even is normal? Um, we're all on a wonderful, we're as diverse as the birds we love. And so normal is not a good word. Possibly what you meant was able-bodied or non-disabled or sighted or hearing or neurotypical or all of the above. Wheelchair bound also, definitely not a great word. It implies that someone is bound, restricted, defined by completely dependent on their wheelchair to be a human which is so disempowering and not cool um no one i've not come across anyone who is down with being described as wheelchair bound um instead just say that they're a wheelchair user they use a wheelchair it's a mobility device it's a tool uh and in fact it's a freedom machine a lot of the time don't don't say someone's wheelchair bound and because impaired is is more and more out of date. Uh, vision impaired is, is becoming less and less used. And so we talk about folks who are blind or have low vision. Uh, my background as an occupational therapist um, is in blindness and low vision services. And I know low vision sort of sounds really vague um, in regular English, uh, but it's actually a very specific um, kind of diagnostic criteria that is used. It's, it's basically the point at which glasses no longer help is basically the point at which you have low vision um, in a real brutal nutshell. Um, so yeah, blind, someone who's blind or has low vision. So this is a really important message. It's not enough to just think you're being inclusive. You have to be intentionally inclusive. Usually that takes more effort and maybe more time and sometimes that costs more money, but that's the difference between really truly being inclusive or just thinking you're being inclusive. So what can you do as a regular birder or a bird outing leader to be welcoming and intentionally inclusive? Smile and say hello to other birders. Uh, the saying hello bit's really important. If someone is blind or has low vision, they won't necessarily just see your smile. So saying hello um, is, is really helpful. And this has to be the universal way of being um, welcoming and inclusive. Include a welcome statement at the beginning of a bird outing and include your pronouns and some subtle behavioral expectations. So pronouns are like she, her, uh, he, his, or they, them, or many other options. And if you are comfortable sharing your pronouns, it can signal to folks who are non-binary or transgender that they are welcome to share their pronouns, which may be different than what others might assume just by looking at them. So a welcome statement might sound something like, hi, everybody, my name's Freya. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm really excited to go birding with you today. Um, I'm not an expert on birds. There is so much to learn. Nobody knows it all. So if you have any questions, please ask. Um, if I don't know or if someone near you doesn't know, we'll all try and figure it out together. And please ask anyone near you because they'll be happy to help as well. Hint, hint, everybody else. We're going to be collaborative and friendly on this outing. Don't single someone out because of a difference unless it is relevant and do this one-on-one. -on -one. For example, if you're about to start an outing and you're all sort of gathered around there together and someone shows up with crutches, please don't be like, oh, look, there's someone with crutches. This is so exciting. Thanks for coming. Because the person with the crutches is now going to be like, well, that's really awkward. Everyone's staring at me and this is even more embarrassing than I thought it might be. I mean, maybe they wouldn't think that, but they might. So that's it's not relevant at that point to single them out it may be relevant later in the outing 
to say, hey, look, up the back, you know, when no one else is sort of watching you all at the front, um, hey, you know, I, I see you have some crutches. They, they know they have crutches. You can say that. Um, I see you have some crutches. There are some stairs coming up. So let me know if you need a hand with them or we can sort of game plan what to do when we get to them. Um, so, you know, let me, let me know what you need when, when we get there. They'll, they'll for sure appreciate your thoughtfulness for doing that. Offer help, but be prepared to graciously accept no. Someone with crutches, um, someone with um, a wheelchair, uh, some anybody, um, if you offer help and they say, oh, no, thanks, I've got it. Don't get all kind of hoiked up about that. Like, oh, well, fine then. I was just trying to help. That's not cool. Um, don't, don't, don't be like that. Um, in ju instead, just be like, oh, okay, no worries. Well, if you do need a hand, let me know. I'd be happy to, to give you a hand later. Just be cool. Uh, if they say yes, don't then charge in and assume you know what help they need because you may not. Uh, and you could put someone at a bit of a risk if you just sort of plow on in there. So the next question to ask if they say yes, they would like your help is to ask them, what would you like me to do? They're the experts on what they need and they will be, I'm sure, quite able to direct you on that. Believe someone if they ID a bird. Trust, but verify. There is nothing more unwelcoming and discouraging than being on a bird outing and uh, announcing to the group excitedly, oh, oh, I think there's an American red stud in that tree. And someone looks at you and says, oh, really? I mean, yeah, I think so. That's why I said it. <laughs> um, as an Australian living in the US, yes, my accent is different to most people uh, who are here, but that doesn't mean I know nothing about birds. Um, it's really discouraging, does not make me want to come back with this group if that's the response I'm going to get. And I know a lot of folks, a lot of folks who are Black, Indigenous or people of colour, a lot of women birders, a lot of younger birders, a lot of birders with disabilities um, get that sort of response. Uh, it's so easy just to change your attitude just a tiny bit to trust but verify, which looks like, oh, cool, an American Red Star, let's see. And you go check it out. And if it's not, then you can say, oh, well, actually, that wasn't an American Red Star because, you know, actually their field marks look a bit more like this and educate in a kind and encouraging way. Don't just assume they're wrong. It's, it's not nice. And speaking of Black, Indigenous and people of colour, be actively anti-racist and anti-homophobic and anti-ableist because uh, there's this concept called intersectionality and that means that a lot of folks um, have multiple identities. So they might be Black and disabled or they might be gay and of Asian, Amer Asian American descent. So... Um, you, it's really important in this inclusion work to be including all kinds of, of birders, uh, not, not just the white, straight, cisgender birders with disabilities, because then you're not, you're not kind of doing it all. Don't force someone to opt out. Go out of your way to allow them to opt in. How do you do that from an organisational perspective? This, by the way, might not be a big organisation. This might be a local bird club or a local um, group of volunteers that um, help at a nature centre or something. What can you do to allow folks to opt in? Create an inclusivity and diversity statement and put it up on your website so everyone can see and use it to hold your employees, volunteers and organisation accountable for the actions you are going to take to ensure that you are focusing on in inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. Hold accessible bird outings as part of your regular programming. Regular programming. Don't just do a once off and think you've done it. That's, that's kind of a token effort. Just if you can hold them monthly, fabulous. Uh, every second month, okay, that's great as well. Uh, 
holding accessible bird outings on accessible trails means people can opt in you're not forcing them to opt out because they can't attend the locations that you're going to and guess what you'll still see birds even if folks with access challenges don't show up but don't forget not everyone with a disability or a health concern uh, you will it, they're not all visible so you won't automatically know if you've um, hit your target audience uh, or not unless someone tells you sometimes and make sure you include that accessibility information in the event write-up. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to submit a site review to the birdability map and link straight to that. But you can also write it up as well. Include image descriptions for social media posts. An image description is written description of what is in that image, uh, be it a photo or an infographic. There's software called um, screen reader software that reads aloud text on screen so that folks who are blind or have low vision, uh, folks with print disabilities, um, folks with visual processing disabilities can access information like emails and the internet uh, without having to see it. But inherently that software cannot read a photo. So you have to tell that software what that photo is of or what it says on that infographic. Otherwise, they've been excluded from learning that. And someone asked me once, oh, but people on Instagram who are, no one who's blind uses Instagram. It's also visual. Well, that's, that's wrong, um, firstly. Secondly, you don't know that. And so by not including that image description, you're forcing them to opt out. Right, but, but if you include it, you're allowing them to opt in. They're really straightforward to do. There's more information on our website about image descriptions and alt text, alternative text. It's very similar, um, but it's embedded in the photo on websites as well. So check out our website if you'd like to learn a bit more about that. Uh, include closed captions for all webinars and meetings, even if no one has asked for them. And tell people at the start that closed captions will be available as well. Because, again, it's not just people who are deaf or hard of hearing who benefit from closed captions. Folks with sensory sensitivities and auditory processing disabilities, um, maybe people who are having a migraine right now, but they can watch, but they just couldn't bear to hear. There's a whole people with funny accents. There's a whole lot of reasons why you or someone else might benefit from closed captions. But if someone has to ask Every time they want to attend a virtual event, will you have closed captions? Will you have closed captions? At some point, they're just not going to come anymore. So closed captions. Um, this is one of those things that may cost extra money. Uh, at the moment, Zoom does not provide closed captions on business accounts for free. Um, I believe they're in a lawsuit about that because that's discrimination. Um, but uh, personal Zoom accounts just recently, you can get closed captions for a personal Zoom account. Um, and there's a link on our website uh, to the Zoom website uh, if you need to request that. Right now, it's not built in. It's by request. Anyway, watch this space because that's changing. But in the meantime, closed captions. Uh, and remove financial barriers to access whenever possible. I, I'm so glad that Learn the Birds is free. Um, because it means people can just come and they don't have to worry about not being able to attend because they can't afford it. Um, so free programs is one way of doing that. Maybe you could have scholarships available. Maybe you could apply for a grant or get a corporate sponsorship to help cover the program costs. But when, when it's not always possible to do, but when it is removing financial barriers, oh, makes such a difference. And provide honorariums for speakers or consultants. This is particularly important um, when you're asking folks who are Black, Indigenous or people of colour or who have a disability or who, or who are LGBTQIA+. Um, because a lot of the time these folks are asked to, to speak or educate um, for free. And that's emotional labour as well as sometimes professional labour and lived experience is pretty valuable information. And even just offering, even, even a small honorarium just indicates that you respect their time and their experience and their, their knowledge. Um, and you don't just expect them to work for free. This includes if you're um, involved in building an accessible trail somewhere and you want to invite some folks with disabilities to come check it out and see if it's okay and if there's any improvements to make. Um, I'm including them in the consultants. Um, 
please offer them an honorarium, even if it's just like $50 or whatever the equivalent, of, you know, not hmm, what's uh, uh, currency conversions into millions of currencies. I can't do that. Even if it's not that, that, that much, but it's something, um, maybe it'll cover their gas, their petrol, <laughs> their public transport ticket. Uh, and again, you're just, res you're demonstrating respect um, that you, that you've even thought of this. So if you have an access challenge or if you know someone who does, we have a bunch of resources um, that we have to hope that you'll be able to go birding and enjoy nature in the outdoors more. Um, as I said at the start, we've only been a nonprofit since January and it's been insanely busy. Um, I'm the only person who's working full time for birdability and um, we have a bunch of stuff on our website, but there's more coming. I just haven't been able to build it yet because of all the other stuff around building a nonprofit. But at the moment, we have the birdability map, which you all know all about already. Uh, we have a web page about adaptive birding equipment, which is really cool. Uh, the first thing on that is Virginia's wheelchair mounted scope. Really, really cool. Um, we have a Facebook group uh, for folks who want to be engaged in this uh, effort, in this work. Uh, we have the Birdability blog, which we're using to amplify experiences of birders with accessibility challenges in the hopes that uh, able-bodied, sighted, hearing, neurotypical birders can learn more about people's uh, experiences and stories and other birders with similar ac or potential future birders with similar access challenges can learn from someone else about how they do what they do in case it helps them out. We have virtual programs, birding through your computer. A lot of folks, that's how they can get to birds. And we, we offer a few of those. Uh, oh, speaking of, our big, big, big event uh, is in October, Birdability Week. And we'll have stuff going on all throughout October as well. So do check that out. There'll be in-person things, but a lot of it will be online. Um, and then we have a lot of resource, other resources and links and, and things on our website. So please, please check it out at birdability.org. And if you'd like to get involved in helping make birding in the outdoors as inclusive and accessible and welcoming and safe as possible, um, we would love to, to have you as part of the Birdability community. You can contribute site reviews to the Birdability map. You already know how to do that. You can become a Birdability captain. There are volunteers uh, if you really, really want to be engaged in this. You can advocate for accessibility improvements in your community. So often the local council um, or the, the, uh, the state or national park or whoever will be so grateful that you let them know, oh, actually this thing here would be so good if you could improve that so more people could get to it. Doing it in a positive uh, way with solutions is the way we've found to be the most effective rather than sort of just complaining um, and getting angry, that doesn't seem to help as much as, as coming with a positive approach. Uh, you can please, please share our resources with anyone who you think might benefit. That's why we have them. So please do that. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter you can sign up for on our website uh, to keep up to date and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at Birdability. And any of our posts, you're always welcome to share um, because this is, this is why we do what we do. And as a nonprofit, uh, any donation is so appreciated and so helpful. So you can donate um, online. Uh, so that should be doable from anywhere in the world. Uh, you can send a check if you're in the US as well. And right now, oh, I didn't update this. Um, right now, we our first fundraising campaign is the Founders Circle campaign. We're inviting individuals, nonprofits and companies to be part of the Birdability Founders Circle um, you have, you actually, despite what that says, you actually have until the end of July, uh, we just extended it, um, to be part of our success in fledging as a nonprofit. And there's more information on our website about the Founders Circle, um, but you, your name or your logo will be remembered uh, in a special place on our website as um, for being part of, of us and our success in, in fledging. So um, if that's of interest, please check it out because birding is for everybody and everybody. So again, um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Birdability, please give us a follow. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, 
um, and um, hearing about upcoming events and things like that. And my email address is info at birdability.org. Any, any um, communication you might submit through our website will go, will go right there as well. Again, it's only me at this end, although I work really closely with Virginia. Um, because it's only me, my inbox is a little out of control. So if you don't hear from me for a week or more, please know I, I very much intend to get back to you, but um, please be patient because um, there's been so much engagement. There's, there's clearly such a need for the work that we're doing um, that unfortunately, sometimes it takes me a while to get back to emails, but I will very much try to do that. So I see there's stuff in the chat. I haven't been able to look in the chat because I've been talking like mad, um, but I'm very excited to hear your thoughts um, and questions and international perspectives on all this. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Freya, for a wonderful and very thought-provoking thought presentation. And yeah, I'm just gonna invite everyone um, because I know we have some people from, various parts of the world, um, from South Africa, we have uh, from Europe, I'm seeing, I think Alma is here from Saudi Arabia. I know someone's here from Ecuador. Um, yeah, there we go. So um, please let us know what's, uh, what's your um, perspective. Joseph is here from Rwanda as well. Um, Amazing. Yeah, I just had, I'm seeing, um, Susanna's asking in the chat if it's possible to have any of the mentioned links emailed. Uh, yes, or I can just throw them straight in the chat as well. So um, the, our website is right there and anything on, our website is not so big that you couldn't find anything pretty, pretty straight, like it's pretty straightforward to find stuff. Um, most of the stuff on the slides you'll find under the guidance documents tab on our webpage about inclusive birders and inclusive organizations and stuff like that and that's how you can get to the birdability map as well so yeah that's that's and that's also how you can um, find a link to donate uh <laughs> fabulous i and i think uh, we have a very small group here so y'all can uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask uh, freya any questions that you might have or let us know your perspective from your country. Have these things been considered? It hasn't really been in, uh, I could tell you in Trinidad and Tobago where I live. Um, these, are, these are quite novel ideas for us here and um, definitely things that we have to implement. So, yeah, the, the floor is open, ladies and gents. Go on then, I'll jump in and say <laughs> thanks so much Freya for that brilliant presentation. Um, I felt there were so many actions that I could take personally, um, but uh, making sure that my involvement in birding is inclusive is really important to me, even though I bird alone a lot of the time or just with my husband, I don't tend to bird in groups, but it's something that I will be doing more and more in the future. and. As you said earlier, none of us know what might happen in the future to us individually. So even if we want to take a very selfish view, if birds are important to us and being out in nature and seeing birds is important to us, then we should be thinking even in terms of how that might affect us in the future. We don't know what's going to happen. But hey, let's just show respect and show inclusivity and kindness to all the other people that we want to share birding with. And so, so many of the actions you gave were just really helpful and thought-provoking so thank you very much for that thanks Susie yeah I yeah it's it's and it's interesting once you get the that welcoming and inclusive mindset um even if you don't bird with other folks in person a, a lot of us are members of the online birding community um and it's been really interesting the last few months I've been paying particular attention to different kinds of things that come out of birding Facebook groups and how some can be really welcoming and inclusive and some people can be really dismissive and discouraging and condescending maybe, or maybe they didn't mean to be, but it sort of sounded like that in the comments they made on someone's photo or something. And um, so I should, I should make sure to add that 
into this presentation that the online birding community is just as important to be welcoming and inclusive as the in-person birding community. And for a lot of folks with accessibility challenges, their birding community will be at the online birding community too. So um, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm really glad that you found it useful and valuable and that there's some thinking points uh, in there. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I'm um, Freya, it's uh, Derek here from, from Learn the Birds, uh, one, of the, one of the founders of Learn the Birds. And I think you've given us something to think about for learn the birds as well. I think there is, we are often uh, in a hurry to get things done. And we often overlook these, uh, these little tricks that uh, will help um, people like, like, you know, making sure your alt tag says something meaningful as opposed to just, you know, a, a thumbnail image or something like that, you know? So yeah, thanks for that. I think for us, we're gonna have to, to do some thinking yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's and and sometimes these things um, they really don't cost any money. It's just they take time and effort, right? To remember to add an image description to your social media post or or alt text to your newsletter images or your um on your um your website images or something. But but it tends not to take that much time. Like it's maybe twenty seconds to type out photo of a laughing kookaburra eating a snake or something. Um, that's all you need in alt text. So, yeah. so it's, it takes time and effort to remember, but it's really not that hard, uh, especially once you get in the habit of it. It just becomes the next, like it's just built into the, what you're doing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I, I, I partly want to apologize for adding to your workload, but I also don't, um, <laughs> don't want to apologize at all. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's good. We want to reach everyone and we want to make everyone's birding experience better no matter who they are, where they come from, and and what their 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 capabilities are. Yeah, yeah awesome. especially that. Yeah, that irrespective of capability, because a lot of people tend to be intimidated, especially if they go out and uh, like say an outing, and there are like ten or fifteen birders with maybe all the scopes and um, cameras and everything, and people can be snobs unintentionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's intentional or unintentional, but this is a question that I wanted to ask you as well. Like, um, how, how do you deal? Like, if you are a bystander and you see someone snob someone else who is like a novice birder, how, how is the best way to approach that situation? Hmm. Um, well, by the way, this scope, I debated about having this visible behind me um for the for the for the reason that it may seem intimidating or um or like you have to have a scope to be a birder you know these subtle messages that you may i mean but then i was like this is brent we just got a sponsorship from zeiss and this is part of it and it's so exciting and i've never had a scope before because it wasn't within my financial means and and so i'm really excited to have this scope but i thought about not having it in case it sent the wrong message um if someone's being a snob, yeah, I don't like bird snobs. Um, I don't really like any snobs, but particularly bird yeah. snobs. Um, you could, if, if you feel comfortable, um, you could say, hey, that wasn't very nice. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> like it's, it seems so like not impressive to say that, but someone may not realize also that they were, or, or you, maybe you might say, hey, that wasn't very encouraging. Mm, yeah. You know, yeah. like, and, and you're sending a message both to the person who did the thing and also to the person that bystander intervention sort of thing, that person um, may feel suddenly like, oh, actually they are included here because they've got an ally. They've got a friend who, who didn't just stand by and sort of let that kind of happen, even though it wasn't like a major, major harm didn't occur. It's still something. Um, and with that, you never know who else is listening and who else heard you say that and who a minute ago felt like they weren't included either and now that they feel like they can be part of this group um you i guess another way to do it is to go up to that the person who sort of received the bird snobbing action and and not not like being snitchy or whatever behind someone else's back but you could just kind of reverse it and be like oh actually i don't think you need optics to go birding uh, would you like to borrow mine though? Because it is really cool if you can see them closer. Like, you know, you could sort of, you may 
want to ignore the person who was the snob, but you could address it directly with that person in a in a yeah. you know nice way, um, yeah. without creating group awkward group dynamics. But yeah, yeah. It, it, the power of doing that can be huge for both that person and for the people around you. That and that extends to hearing anything said on a bird outing that's racist or potentially racist or homophobic or ableist or sexist. Um, all of those things. If you may or may not want to go up to the person who said it, but especially if you're the outing leader, yeah, you have some duty of care there to be like, hey that sounded like it could have been really racist and we're not racist here. Yeah. And just sort of calling it out just like that can be enough to just stop that right there. Yeah. Um, and, and if you're the, if you're the leader, I do, I do think there's some responsibility there to step in and address that directly mm -hmm. potentially. Yeah. I think so. Like just a, uh, just a nip in the bud, you know? Yeah. Uh, there are times I think that when you have to be forceful and to be forceful uh, for good is is probably one of the most important times to be forceful you know like just to put your foot down and say listen this is not a place where we tolerate that kind of um, sentiment yeah right but, yeah and I know like I'm actually really not that assertive about myself um I have a really hard time standing up for myself, but I can stand up for someone else. Yeah. And so sometimes that's the kind of the bravery you might need to be like, yeah. hey, wait a second. That person is maybe not even your friend, but that's just a fellow burden that that shouldn't have happened to them. And so yeah. maybe that gives you the courage to, you know, step forward and do something. Um, yeah. And maybe, maybe it would be more appropriate to take that, that person around the back or quietly and just sort of have a one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe that's the better way to do it too. It, it, I'm sure it would depend on the person and on you and on the situation and on what was said and if it's repeat behavior, and all of that. But um, yeah, I think, I think it's important not to just let it slide because that indicates you're okay with it. Yeah. And that's the problem. That's the, yeah, 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 for sure. That um, silence is compliance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, seeing Lynette is saying in the chat, I've taught blind children and I've always taught toyed with the idea of teaching the blind the bird calls so that they can enjoy auditory birding. I'm a very active recorder of bird calls and it's definitely something to think about in the future. Birding by sound is so important for visual birders too. I yes. wholeheartedly agree. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's one of my amazing regrets that I, you know, I worked as an occupational therapist in blindness and low vision services, and I never took any of my clients birding. But occupational therapy is very client centered and no one asked me to take them birding. So I didn't, um, I didn't kind of force it on anybody, but I also didn't suggest it as an opportunity, something we could explore. But I'm really excited. I'm working with the Alabama School for the Blind here um, for next, the start of next year to do a series of programming with their students uh, about birds and birding and um, yeah and we know a bunch of folks who are totally blind or who have low vision who who are who love birding um, one of one of the people we know um, is a crazy lister he has um, retinitis pigmentosa so his peripheral vision um, is something close to this um, and he is on a mission to see half the world's bird species while he can see them. Uh, mm -hmm. But he counts the, the herd ones too. Uh, and then we know another guy who's a fabulous birder by ear who's totally blind. And yeah, yeah, there's, there's, so, much, there's so much scope. Um, so I hope you do, Lynette. And I'd, I'd really love to hear how it goes because um, there's so much, so, much, so much possibility in that. I'm just um, going to post uh Lynette's okay Derek did it good um that's her uh, YouTube channel where she has a bunch of um excellent bird calls awesome oh yeah. and I'm just looking slowly looking through the chat um Susie I said you said you were not sure how much information to include in the image description um so check out our website um if you're on social media uh, if you're if you happen to be on Instagram, the highlights are really awesome on our Instagram because we can I can save the posts, you know, and we have a whole big post about um, image descriptions and a few um, other posts. The National Park Service in the U.S. do fabulous image descriptions. Some of them are 
hilarious. They don't have to be super like a white woman with brown hair and an orange t-shirt is like, they can be really fun and like quirky and stuff as well. So um, it, you don't have to include every single thing, but the, the key information that you want someone who's looking at the photo to take away is the stuff you should include in the written, in the image description. Thanks for that. Um, I've been, yeah, struggling with that a little bit because I want to uh, make sure that my photographs are descriptive so that people who use readers can um, know what's in the photograph. And uh, I do a bird quiz every Wednesday and at least one of my regular contributors um, has, um, well, I think actually he's, he's fully blind, but um, so I always make, that's how I started to do my descriptions. But on Instagram, I'd noticed a few other birders had started to put their descriptions in, which is what I've started doing now as well. But yeah, I just didn't know how much to put in. And like mm. when you're trying to do a quick post, and then you think, right, okay, no, stop. I've got to, so I've started, <laughs> I know it sounds sad, but I've started keeping um, a kind of spreadsheet of which posts I'm putting in case I want to use the photograph again. I've already got the description written up then so that mm -hmm. I can include that. But yeah, on my newsletter and um, my website is the, is the hard one. That is going to take a lot of retrospective, but I'm also doing transcripts of my podcast. So that's also something, being one person banned, as you know yourself, with you said about your email thing, um, building it yourself, it takes a lot of time. So that's going to have to be a work in progress. But absolutely, I'm really keen to make sure that I'm not excluding anyone. So I'm doing the best. And, it's, and also, even within my podcast, when I'm describing like the size of birds and things, I've had some advice about how to, um, so you don't just say it's the size of a sparrow or the size of a pigeon, but you might relate it to something that is a fruit or vegetable, something that people can hold and can you know so but it does sound odd when you're not used to talking that way to say oh, well you know this house sparrow is the size of a peach or size of a plum or something you know but it's just you know if we it's like using the pronouns if you get familiar with just using them then it just becomes a matter of course and it's not like oh they've said that it's just like no let's just this is how we're going to speak this is how we're going to use the language so I really appreciate all of the really positive um, actions you put forward there and the ways that we can all do that in our everyday speaking it doesn't have to be on a bird outing and I'm going to take on board what you said about bird out outing because some of my episodes are bird walks that I've termed bird walks as a shorthand um, but you know there's absolutely no reason why I can't change that to bird outing and um, so I shall be doing that retrospectively on the titles but uh, also going forward that's what I will use because it is a more inclusive term so thank you for that. Yeah, no worries. And if it helps. So I, I actually work for a podcast um, and radio show um, called Talking Birds, and it's all about birds and conservation. We've had Faraz on. Um, and I, here's a secret that's not public knowledge. I do the Talking Birds Instagram as well. Um, as Talking Birds fits around birdability. Um, and I copy paste the image descriptions from previous posts because I use a graphic. And so the logo is always in the same place and much of the text is always in the same place. And I just copy and paste that and then just change the description for the photo that's within the graphic. You know, so you can make it a little easier on yourself. Yeah, um, no, I've definitely doing been doing that, that for my um, yeah. episode Good. artwork. But it's the, uh, <laughs> it's the regular social media posting that, you know, trying to build yeah. up, you know, attention for the shows yeah. that, you know, but thank you for that. And it, yeah. and, and it may seem like so much to go backwards and do, but at least if you start now and make a commitment to do it all forwards, you know, you can do backwards as much as possible, but, but as long as everything forwards is fabulous, then that's massive, you know, that's massive awesome. Um, so don't, don't feel like you have to make everything perfect historically before you start doing it regularly now. Great. Can you see the name of the podcast one more time, please? It's Ray Brown's Talking Birds, right? Ray Brown's Talking Birds. There's no G in talking. Um, yeah. That's the one. Yep. <laughs> talking Birds, yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, most of all, the positive attitude towards, um, towards whatever situation it is, that's the most important thing, you know? Like, how do you approach a situation? And, you approach, and with everything, not only birding, but, you know, whatever, whatever it might be in life whatever life right. throws at you yeah 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 okay i'm wondering if anyone has any more questions i think i got everyone's questions in the chat i'm just checking it 
just checking it here. I think oh, you got everyone. We have, a, we have a physical therapist or a physiotherapist better. That's great. My, my Instagram handle is the OT Verda. So I, sorry, I'm just catching up on the chat here. Um, oh, Alma. yeah, that's Alma, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think. Um, Freya, just, uh, sorry, just. Uh, go ahead. Freya, yeah, go ahead, Derek. My, my wife's an OT as well, and she did her master's on uh, birding with this, um, sorry, on tourism with disabilities. So. Yes, yeah, yes. it's pretty cool, eh? And yeah. Freya is her friend. They work together in Saudi Arabia. I, I'm sorry, Alma is her friend. So. <laughs> okay, okay. Small Esther, world. Esther, is Esther your wife? Sorry. Sorry? Esther, Esther is your wife? <laughs> yeah. That's in the comments. Yeah, right. Cool. I would, I would, I would love to chat with, um, with Esther and with Alma for that matter. Oh, I mean, I'd chat with anybody, but particularly <laughs> about pedophilia things. Um, yeah, yeah, there's, there's so much, there's so much to offer using our professional background in, in birding in the outdoors. Yeah. I particularly enjoy your definition of, uh, of birding as opposed to bird watching. Cause that's also something that I have been pushing for myself and for, you know, whoever it is that I, I communicate with that, um, bird watchings, you know, it's really, cause I mean, humans are predominantly a visual species. Um, but for me, I have, I've started to, to lose vision in one of my eyes and it's kind of like, it's helped me slow down and, and really immerse myself. Cause it's not only about hearing, but it's also about like, when you, when you are there in nature and you can feel the, the presence of a bird, like if there's a, a beautiful raptor that sits down and, you know, some birds just have a presence, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to describe in terms of a visual sense. So there are things that um, that would that that you would feel um, not in terms of touch, but of you know, um, but in terms of that presence. I remember once I was like camped out in a in a in a mangrove, and maybe about fifty scarlet ibis flew overhead. They didn't see me, so they were like they were really low, and I felt I heard like the the rustling of their wings as they were flying over, and I felt the the wind as they passed and you know that is an experience that was maybe like uh, eight years ago or or something like that but I felt that that stayed with me so it's a lot more than um than than just sight and just watching so I really like that definition of birding the um another thing too about us being visual species um i know a lot of folks including me um don't necessarily want to admit to being a someone who's good at birding by ear um i'm not super good at it um and i know a lot of people who say you know i'm really terrible like they totally don't want to be anywhere near the expected idea of birds by ear um but most people who have some hearing do some birding by ear if it's just oh i hear a bird What's yeah. that bird? And like, you know, it's that's that's still birding by ear, right? That Just is, to an extent, exactly. you, you're being alerted to the bird's presence. So yeah. So calling it birding rather than bird watching includes, yeah, all of the not just the a different group of people who might be excluded by watching, but yeah. also every way you can enjoy wild birds. Yeah. I think birding should never be limited by one's ability to identify the bird. Mm -hmm. you know, once you can notice that there is a bird there and you can notice the presence of the bird, hey, you're birding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. birding. Yeah, and I've, I've heard, I don't remember who it was, but I heard someone talking about um, you, don't, you don't need to know the name. You don't even know, need to know like what the name might even possibly be. Just make the name up. Like, does it matter if you're enjoying the bird? Like, call it whatever you want and get your kids to call it whatever they want or, who, you know, like it, 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 as long as there's in enjoyment, it, it, yeah. it doesn't really matter of course you can you know like um you can find it out later or, and, you know, or not even <laughs> or not yeah you know um and also i was just going to say quite a lot of birds were named because of the yellow fronted whatever so if you're going to pick out the most identifiable um features to describe oh i just saw that red fronted brown little bird you know it, it's uh the chances are you might even hit on the right name or the the, yeah. the actual name anyway <laughs> yeah 
So it's interesting when I when I'm out birding and I, I see a bird and I hear it, I often make up a name for it based on what it sounds like. So you know, something like the Rufus Snape Lark, I call Sweetie because its call is like Sweetie, you know, <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, um, the, 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 the Cape Robin Chat, which is common in my garden. It always sounds to me like it's uh, it's saying, I'm so, I'm so sweet, I'm so sweet, come see me, come see me. So I call it, I'm so sweet. And, and I don't even think of it sometimes as Cape Robin Chat, and that's perfectly fine. Sure. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I think I wouldn't have to start doing that. Just make up your, oh, you would make up the greatest names for us. You'd make up <laughs> such fa fabulous, like magical, you know, if any of you all are on Instagram, I hope you follow for us because it's his posts and photos and thoughts and it's just wonderful. And, and I can't wait to see what names you make up. And, the, you know, I'll be commenting, like, is that the actual bird's name or is that your name for it? Because I'm trying yeah. to learn the, the standard name for that bird in a place I've never been, but I <laughs> I can't wait to see your your creations as well. <laughs> oh man, you're setting um high standards for me. I haven't been posting <laughs> in a while, but I have to start back. But I'm definitely going to start looking at doing these, you know, deliberate image descriptions when I do start back with um, posting. Um, Joseph is asking what about what what advice about guiding someone with disabilities? Yes, well, uh, that is a very big question because there are so many different kinds of disabilities and different people will, will appreciate different, um, different things more than others, even if they have a similar access challenge. Um, check out the Welcoming and Inclusive Birders page on our website, although that's more about your attitude rather than like any kind of hands-on thing you're doing. Um, the best advice I can give without any further information is ask them what they need because they'll tell you. Um, and and just like, what, what do you need from me so that, you know, you feel comfortable at this birding location or so we can, you know, go down this trail or whatever thing um, and do it if you can. Um, it might be something like, you know, I need you to help me with that step or um, it might be something like, um, maybe someone with low vision, you know, Michael, um, our mate who gets clocked on the head by low hanging branches um, because he's got retinitis pigmentosa and doesn't see branches that someone who's fully sighted might see and just move out of the way without thinking about it. You know, I know he, um, he likes being able to walk behind someone with his hand on their shoulder. So if they move out of the way of a branch, like he'll automatically just sort of follow and, and not get whacked in the head. So um People will tell you what they need and um, having that, that, yeah, coming into it really open-mindedly, not like you have to have all the answers because people will have different, yeah, different needs and they'll let you know. Yeah. And that, that positive attitude for sure. You know, like if, if you approach someone with that um, positive attitude, then I think they are going to be more willing to divulge certain issues that they may be having. You know, because I've been in situations before as a guide where people don't feel comfortable saying, you know, I can't hear that call or I can't see that well, you know. So only tell me when a bird is within 10 meters, you know, or don't don't tell me, are you hearing that sound, that faint sound in the distance, right? Um, that's a so-and-so because I can't hear it because I've been working in aircraft hangars my entire life or, or whatever, you know. Um, so yeah, I think I would add to what you're saying to Joseph and just say, just, just be nice, just be welcoming and genuine and warm and positive. Yeah, I, but not so far to the point where you become a little bit condescending. Yeah. Because that it's, doesn't feel good. Um, yeah, that's something to look out for. But, but, but yeah, just like, hey, what do you, what do you need from me? What do you need from me? And we'll, yeah. we'll figure it out. And, and that kind of collaborative approach too can make them feel more empowered to, yeah, tell you what they need and um, not just be expecting to be sort of dragged around <laughs> by the guide, you know, when they're trying, just, just trying to keep up and they don't feel comfortable to tell you that they need you to do something different. So I hope that's very general advice, but I think it applies to most situations. <laughs> I think so. I think so. 
Well, um, I see Derek just dropped off, um, but he says, awesome presentation. And I am tempted to agree with him 100%. I enjoy this. Um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, very thought thought provoking presentation. And I think we've answered all the questions. I don't see any more questions coming in, but I'm seeing a lot of thank yous and fantastic presentations and all of that, all of that stuff. So yeah, so on behalf of the Learn the Birds team, I'd like to thank you for this wonderful presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. And I hope to see you all tomorrow for my Bird is the Word show. Mm. So yeah, that's that's my own plug there for, for tomorrow. So yeah, um, thank you again. Thanks so uh, much, y'all. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.